Okay, let's get started. Uh, my name is Raj. Uh, glad to see all of you here. Um, how are the sessions so far? Good stuff? Well, you're going to be prepared to be disappointed then, right? So, um, I'm only slightly joking. Uh, the, the reason I even submitted this talk uh, was based on my experiences. None of the material that I'm going to present here is earth shatteringly new or revolutionary. It's been done by thought leaders and disseminated to the Agile community for over 10 years. But what I see is, as a, a practitioner and as a coach, with a lot of teams, uh, especially with new teams moving towards Agile, it's, still, it's a constant struggle dealing with uh, preparing stories for consumption within their sprints or Kanban, whatever the framework it is that they're using, as well as getting stories to done. Uh, <clears throat> so I thought, you know, why not I just sort of submit this talk and Naresh was nice enough to accept the talk and here I am and I'm happy to see lots of people here. Uh, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, uh, I just want a quick show of hands as to who's, I'm assuming a lot, lot of you are either with undergoing an Agile transformation or working on Agile teams, is that fair? Yeah, lots of them, okay. So um, how many of you are dealing with user stories and have uh, user stories? Everybody, right? It's nothing new, right? It's been around since the early days of Agile. And uh, how many of you have uh, taken a deliberate approach to splitting stories, looking at splitting uh, patterns for stories and so forth? A lot of you, there's nothing new here then. <laughs> so, <laughs> just a refresher. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, in terms of, uh, looks like the majority of you folks are uh, pretty familiar with stories and splitting <laughs> strategies. Um, just a quick show of hands, and there's no shame here. Uh, anybody who's not applied any splitting um, patterns towards story splitting and so forth at all? Good, oh, there's quite a few, okay. Uh, so those subset of folks, are you dealing with user stories at all, or are you just still in traditional methods moving towards Agile? Just curious. You're using user stories, but lots of pain, right? Okay, sorry. <clears throat> okay, that, that's, uh, that's uh, informational. So I will be introducing the idea of uh, several different spreading strategies, of course, and for those who are already uh, doing this, perhaps it's a nice refresher and you can chime in and maybe mention uh, strategies that I'm not going to cover here, okay? Um, <clears throat> we'll start off the session, outline is pretty straightforward. Uh, we'll just quickly ground ourselves and uh, ourselves in stories, what the purpose is, and then very quickly delve into um, story splitting strategies and how do we really prepare stories uh, so, so as to get them to done um, in an efficient manner using these splitting strategies and then we'll have some time for Q&A, okay? I wanna keep this pretty conversational, especially when we start coming to the different spreading strategies, I'll sort of throw out an example, and we'll try to see how the, uh, we can apply a given strategy towards breaking up these uh, stories, if you will, into smaller bite-sized chunk, okay? I wanna make sure that this is pretty conversational and it's back and forth, especially because all of you have done this quite a bit, so. All right, ready to get started? Yeah, all right. So thinking in stories, uh, before we even talk about story splitting, what the heck is a user story anyway? Anybody? What is it? User role value, a chunk of what? Requirement. Chunk of requirement, yeah. So any, anything else? I heard somebody else uh, scream something else. Would somebody say this? No? All right. So a, a user story is a lightweight expression of uh, a given user segment or users um, need the, the business proposition, if you will. And I know the most popular template out there is this Connextra format, a Mike Cohn's template, which is as a such and such, as a certain user, I want to invoke some capability, some function, so that it achieves some larger outcome. Right? So, so these are the essential considerations, regardless of whether you stick to this format or some other for format, it's, it's sort of useful to consider those three perspectives. Role, um, and then what do you want the system to do, and why do you want this to do it? What larger outcome uh, do you, are, are you, are you try, trying to go after? And this is per 
perfect even for whether it's for software or even non-software initiatives. I deal with a lot of uh, software as well as non-software non transformations and we use these aspects to define our uh, user needs uh, in, in, this, in this specific uh, um, uh, format. So what I want to first uh, uh, draw to your attention is don't get too caught up. At least this has my, my, been my experience. I've been in the Agile community a long time. My uh, introduction was to Scrum and XP in 2003. What I see is there's, especially these days with the mass adoption uh, of Agile, user stories of obviously are central to most of these uh, teams in terms of how they're thinking about requirements, is there is this blind adherence to this format. The format is not that important. What's important is who the audience is, what it is they're trying to do, and to what larger outcome. That's really the important facets of, um, of, the, of this lightweight expression. And uh, how many of you have heard of uh, Ron Jeffries, the three C's of a user story? Well, quite a few people, right? Every story, no matter how you express it, whatever format, needs to conform to these three guiding principles. The first C in the three C is it's a card. A card is essentially a token. Uh, and it's intentionally meant to be this little small index card because you don't want to write the entire requirement, right? Details are meant to emerge over time. They are not locked down up front, very different than our traditional approaches. So I would be hesitant to call it a requirement because a user story is not intended to be a replacement for a requirement. It never was. I don't think it, it's, it's going, ever going to be, right? Uh, the details will emerge in time. The, uh, the second C in the three Cs, uh, that Ron Jeffries um, mentions is the idea that it's a token for, for having a conversation. The real uh, details of what it is that you're trying to build that capability emerge during conversations. And conversations are going to trump all other aspects of trying to jot it down into a format or put it into a JIRA tool or whatever else it is, right? So that's, that's the second part of um, the, uh, the, the three Cs. And finally, and importantly, at least it's been my experience that lots of stories in the teams that I'm working with, they perhaps are uh, small enough to fit on a card. And uh, people, we do have these grooming sessions. You're talking about the, uh, uh, the, the, the details. But oftentimes, the third C is forgotten, which is every user story should have unambiguous uh, conditions of satisfaction. You need to know what it is that needs to be satisfied to say that the story is done. Um, and many a time I see teams sort of, sort of ignoring this aspect, okay? This is critical because this is what's gonna ensure you're getting to done, okay? So um, can any of you, what's a practical aspect of this confirmation, uh, the confirmation aspect from a technique perspective? We talk about acceptance criteria, right? That's really essentially what that is, right? But the important aspect is it should represent a shared understanding for programmers, testers, and business, right? Unambiguous, right? Okay, so we've talked a little bit about what a story is, the three Cs, and finally, who's heard of the mnemonic in, uh, invest, right? Invest, again, it's an old idea, right? It's often good for us to, as we write our user stories, to think about uh, uh, the, the validity of the story through the lens of invest. Invest stands for uh, the I is independent, negotiable, valuable, estimable. I don't necessarily want to sort of go through each of these aspects, but I would, for those who haven't sort of uh, uh, been exposed to this, I would absolutely encourage you to go Google, look it up. Bill Wake is the guy who sort of uh, uh, came up with that mnemonic and uh, definitely read up on it. But what I want to focus on from our splitting perspective is two aspects. Every story ought to be valuable. Valuable to whom? Customer. Customer. Do you think there's no value in knowledge ac acquisition? Meaning that sometimes you're doing some things where you don't really have true end user value just yet, but perhaps you're doing something in order to move towards that ultimate goal of end user value. So I believe that every now and then, knowledge acquisition has a place in terms of being valuable, right? Um, and small, what does that imply? Huh? Within the iteration, somebody said. What else? Does one thing. Can be completed in one sprint, smaller. 
it has a value, yes, of course, right? We said uh, every story, if you look through a lens, has to be valuable. Yeah? So oftentimes what it seems, uh, is, at least in my experience, is when you say I want a given story to be valuable and I want it to be small, teams say it can be done. Right? Because inherently, when you think about value to end user, you think about a fully featured capability. Right? Not necessarily. Right? Uh, and small, at least in my opinion, humble opinion, doesn't necessarily mean your, the, your job is to split stories to fit in a sprint. Whether using time, bar, time boxes or whether using flow-based uh, frameworks, the point of small stories is to discover our direction and value. Right? These are all little experiments that are guiding us. Agile frameworks are all empirical frameworks. Right? It's, the point is about getting feedback. The, the, the goal shouldn't be about trying to fit it into a sprint. That should be the natural outcome, um, but should, should not be the root reason. But I, I, I concur with you in the, in, 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 the, in the point that a lot of, lot of teams are really thinking about stories about, I wanted to split it so it fits in my time box. That should just naturally emerge. And I would, cons I, I, would, I would challenge you guys to go back and think about it from a value proposition and a feedback proposition, rather than think about, my goal is to split it to fit into a sprint. Right, so that should be the consequence. All right, so we've talked a little bit about um, all of these aspects. Now let's get it, let's get into the, the actual splitting strategies because we want them to be valuable, be it knowledge acquisition or uh, end user value, and we want them to be small. But why small? Why should they be small? Besides the whole fitting into my time box thing, because now I'm doing agile, I got to. Huh? So you want QA to test feedback, okay? To be, to be able to fail fast, yeah, rapid feedback, because it's an iterative process, and if, if you're going in the wrong direction, we want to know that sooner, right? Okay, what else? Potentially, in some, yeah, maybe you are releasing these incremental, it's not fully featured, but it's fully functional, that tiny sliver. Maybe your business cases, you will deploy that into production and whatnot, uh, but that's not necessarily the business case for everybody, but it's still valuable. It's, it's about short feedback cycles. What else? What's that? But maybe the idea of breaking things up will make the implicit requirements emerge, right? That's a powerful reason to make things small. There's lots of hidden requirements that don't emerge if you don't break things, right? Uh, another reason would be, so we talked about feedback, we talked about uh, requirements sort of emerge, implicit requirements emerging. It also means you're giving your product owner, if you're in that sort of a, 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 a setup, uh, options, real options to say, I just want to do these certain things, the rest are not that important just yet, or maybe ever, right? It helps with prioritization and sequencing things, right? There's lots of benefits to being small other than just the fact that it fits in the spring, uh, in, in the sprint, okay? All right, any questions thus far before we sort of go into uh, the different splitting strategies, yeah? right? So we understand the purpose of things being small, we understand what the notion of value, so let's explore some strategies. And as I had mentioned, all of these strategies are not new. They've been around a long time. In fact, because of, of the time constraints that we have, I'm going to probably just explore 10 of them, right? I would strongly encourage you to go back and look. There's folks, people like Kent McDonald, who's actually is speaking uh, here on some other unrelated topic, has, has, has done lots of work uh, on strategies and so forth. So they're there, and I'll share a few resources, uh, and my slides will be available so you can look them up. There's lots of other strategies beyond what uh, the ones that I'm talking about, okay? All right, let's talk um, uh, a little bit about how uh, requirements really emerge, right? I'm assuming in most organizations, be it traditional or, or agile, you are starting with some higher level um, business objective or outcome that you're trying to reach, which you're then going to break it up into these broad, uh, big chunks of uh, activity or features, call it features, epics. I'm not going to get into the battle of whether you call it an epic or a feature. It, these are big things, right? Big borders. And you're going to sort of uh, progressively, if you're in an agile uh, environment, break them into these bite-sized chunks um, or these little pebbles and which are, which are then subsequently decomposed into, if you're in, in, in a, a product development environment, coding tasks, or if you're non-software, still, there are some tasks that make up these stories, right? And as I had mentioned, 
unambiguous conditions of satisfaction are distilled as ex acceptance criteria. And, um, and these days, through testable examples. And I'll, I'll revisit that pattern uh, later on as a splitting strategy. But this is essentially what happens in some form in most organizations. True, not true? Right? Yeah, absolutely, nothing new here. Uh, <clears throat> So we talked about a small uh, a, a pattern that I see, and perhaps you can share your experiences, especially with new teams. We understand we want to, we want to split these. We want to uh, progressively uh, elaborate uh, our, our epics and features and so forth. But what I often see is uh, the breaking up of these big boulders happens across architectural layers, right? People are nodding their heads. Absolutely, right? Because that's our comfort zone. If especially we don't have full stack developers, maybe I'm a DBA, then there's a front end expert, there's a middle tier person, whatever. We're always breaking our things into what we know best, which is our architectural layer, right? Not very valuable. Why is it not valuable? You can't test it. And it's, there's no business value. I mean, the end user can't, and what else? It doesn't give opportunities for prioritization. Yeah, it's not a fully working thing. Saying that I finished my data model, saying, woohoo, who cares, right? <laughs> um, so the feedback cycle is deferred if you start breaking things. But this seems to be a very natural uh, tendency for folks to break this way. Also, it sort of continues to keep that silo mentality. Yes, we have our role specialities. But it sort of reinforces that I'm doing my part, I'm done with it, I'm going to hand it to some, somebody else, right? We want to eliminate that silo mentality, we want to minimize these handoffs. So the right way to approach splitting first and foremost is to, if we are doing horizontal slices by, by architecture layer, is to look at it from a cross-cutting perspective. All the layers of whatever makes up your slice of the pie, right? If it's a traditional three-tier app, user interface, business value, uh, database, some thin sliver. So that should be our first goal. If you're not doing it, we have to make sure that at least we are starting there, right? Uh, <clears throat> so once we sort of uh, get that in play, how do I go about splitting, strategy, uh, splitting these stories, vertical slices? So first and foremost, I'll give you some of the most obvious ones, right? Uh, this strategy called workflow steps um, is useful when you're given story uh, it describes a sequence of steps or activities that the user is going to have to do in order to realize um, uh, the, that outcome that they're interested in. So I'm going to give an example, right? As a, a, a learner, somebody who wants to take a class somewhere, I want to register for a class and pay for it using a credit card so that I'm better informed about Agile. Maybe I want to take a class on, on Scrum or something, right? So that's my story. Perfectly articulated, right? Conforms to all the different aspects of role, what and how, what I want, uh, the outcome, everything, right? So take a, take a look at the story, and the way it's articulated, I made sure that this story, there are some workflow steps. What are some of the workflow steps you can think about when you read that? Registration. registration. What does registration entail? Looking for a class registering for the class, payment, and uh, what payment itself can be broken down into what? Payment method, maybe prior to payment, reviewing my order, right? Post payment, maybe acknowledgement of a receipt. Yeah, notifications. As you can see, I mean, you're all smart people here, and you know, you've already broken it down to like a million different things, right? Uh, when you think about all the things you said, this feels like it's an entire application in itself, right? Expresses a nice little story, fits on a card, right? <laughs> so, so again, some of this is pretty common sense. Uh, uh, view the courses, select a course, review, pay, notification, you, 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 you get the picture. So some of the key questions uh, you might want to think about when sort of uh, uh, breaking these down by workflow stuff, this is pretty straightforward, is can you take a thin slice through all aspects Clearly, you won't be able to finish all of this in a sprint. Well, you won't be able to finish this in two sprints, right? So we know we need to break this down. One tactic is, can I sort of do a little thin needle through all aspects? Maybe it's not fully, fully featured, but can I do little pieces of it, right? That's one thing to consider. Short of that, you say, no, it's not possible for me to weave a narrative through all of those pieces. But the other thing to think about is, can I do the first one, and can I do the last one? Because the real value is in where? 
finally I'm, I want to take the darn class, right? Uh, you know. so, so maybe think of your stories in that manner uh, when, you, when you talk about workflow. First step, last step, can I do those, right? You should do that. And then all the other things we've talked about become additional stories that will come in time. Now this gives real options for a product owner because clearly these are all valuable things but especially valuable if you're doing the first and the last because that gives them the ability to actually sign up for the class. Make sense? Right, so. <clears throat> all right, second one. This is fairly straightforward uh, and perhaps you guys are using this all the time which is breaking up a story by operations, right? So in this one, and I'm, I want you guys to play along, right? As a training provider, we'll take the same theme. As a training provider, I want to manage my course offerings so that learners can actually view them and sign up for some classes, right? That's my story, right? What are the implicit operations here? Creating my classes, what else? Deleting, editing, yeah, absolutely. You, searching, everything, right? There's lots of things that are happening here. When you, when you hear the word manage, configure, administer, right away, you know that you're doing multiple things, right? So operations, break it down by that. And again, look at it, breaking this down through this, these uh, different activities makes, it seems common sense. But also in addition, make sure that you're doing the most valuable one first in terms of a good look, but look at it through invest. Is it really that valuable that I can do delete first? Not really, right? Uh, is this that valuable, adding a class? Yes, I would question that, right? Why, because I can easily have a flat file that I present and, and the ability for the user to select that, it's possible. Even edit, I can re-upload a CSV file, right? So you got to be a little more deliberate about, about how you apply these strategies, right? Um, so. <clears throat> so my pet peeve with a lot of stories, and I don't know about you, uh, you guys, is when I see stories that say, as a user, do this, as a user, do that, as a user, do that. Uh, what's especially worse is when I say, as a developer, do this, right? <laughs> so, um, the problem with it is we're not thinking, we're blindly applying that uh, format without thinking about who, who is this user? Is there nuances? There's always nuances to the different kinds of roles or personas in tracking the system, right? Um, so in this case, as a learner, I want to register for a class. Okay, sounds simple enough. But perhaps if you think about it, if I'm a learning organization, there's the learners and there's the, uh, the training providers perhaps. And sometimes I might want to be able to register you into the class, right? So I'm doing the same operation, but with a slightly different perspective, right? I'm a different role, right? Um, so these kind of distinctions also have a powerful way for us to uh, split things, because they are similar, but maybe not exactly the same. And if you go back, if you're not doing this, I would strongly urge you to go back and look at your story and say, are you truly being deliberate about the actual uh, user segment interacting with your capability or function, right? So, so far, so good? It's useful stuff? You guys doing all of this already? So let me take a quick pause here. We went through workflow operations role. You guys do all of these? Good. Only two people? <laughs> all right, a few. All right. So nothing new, no new, no new learnings for them here. All right, so another simple one is data boundaries, right? Um, so this is about when your initial story does, uh, interacts with, with, with a certain entity, but different facets, different pieces of data on that, uh, that one entity that it's operating on. So in this example, I present to you, as a learner, I want to view course information, so that blah, blah, blah. So what are the different pieces of data that you think that I can break the story up by? Financial Say that again? Financial description, so on and so forth, right? Uh, anything else? You mentioned something else? Course. course, the actual course, right. So maybe in this case, the data boundaries are there's different facets, right? There's, there's different attributes to what a course means. Maybe a first pass name and description is sufficient to get me going. And then the course agenda, instructor qualifications, is Raj 
qualified to teach this silly class? Well, I don't know. I'm gonna, so maybe the facility information. There's lots of things. When you start delving into a given entity, there's lots of facets. The question is, is it uh, worthwhile for us to break it up along those channels um, so that we can get this going um, and then come back and add the additional details later? Right? So one thing I want to sort of stop, pause here and, 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 and mention, um, just because these stories are small enough, it doesn't mean it's one and done. What I mean by that is this is not something, Agile is not about saying I, I touched this, I finished this, I'm going to move on to something else. It never was. Agile is incremental and iterative. Iterative means you will be revisiting these things again. Okay, it's not a question that you won't ever come back to that capability. So it's okay that you take a thin sliver, but you're gonna come back and revisit it and add additional uh, nuances to this, um, uh, to this capability, right? So perhaps that's, that's a split that may well be uh, worth it for you guys in terms of uh, breaking things up. Uh, <clears throat> so now we'll look at a few more, as we go through a few more examples, it'll get a little more uh, complex in terms of these scenarios. So, Simple first and then enhance again is a strategy where the initial story as this indicates has some base set of functionality that provides most of the value, either value from an end user perspective or from a knowledge acquisition perspective, okay? Um, so this is really tied to the whole notion of 80-20 rule, right? You heard of the 80-20 rule, right? Most capabilities, 80% of the value is realized by 20% of the work, right? Uh, <clears throat> so. I want to give a solution. So as a learner, I want to see my past courses so that I can do something, right? So what is the base functionality that we're trying to provide here? Just show me all the darn things, right? That's my simplest use case. Of course, all of us are working on systems where we have lots of searching for things and then you want dynamic searching, yada, yada, yada. It essentially is adding complexity. I'm not saying it's not needed, but the question is, is it needed just yet? Right, um, but I want to filter by topic. I want to just show show me only the past two months. Whatever else your particular domain is, almost always you will find a natural seam where there is a base functionality that maybe it's it's not necessarily simple, but still maybe worthwhile for you to take a look and say, is it is it is it going to save me? Um, some time in terms of feedback because I just at least get my basic search in and then I'll come back and make it more dynamic and so forth, right, so, and ad hoc. Um, major effort, so this is again a typical pattern that, that you might come across. Um, <clears throat> so where there's a lot of effort that may have to be expended in order to get that first little bit of capability uh, going, right? So as a learner, I wanna pay for my class with Visa, American Express, MasterCard, Yada, 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 you get the picture. So where do you think the major effort here is? <laughs> Payment gateway, right? I want to get that in place. That's my biggest effort, major, uh, and that may take some more time, so be it. It's gonna take the time it's gonna take, right? Um, so the question is, when we're building the pay payment gateway, do we still want us to at least pick one, uh, one card to ensure that it works? Now the question is, does it matter whether it's Visa or American Express? Maybe, in, given my experience about American Express here, I'd say yes, it matters because nobody wants to take American Express here. So um, maybe I, I want to just try mine with Visa because perhaps that's more valuable, right? Um, and then uh, is it worthwhile then to break them up into uh, separate stories for MasterCard and American Express and PayPal and whatnot? Why not? Okay, so that's what I'm saying, yeah, this is fine. We said we'll play with one. What is the next logical split after that? All the cards together. All the cards together, the right? Cards. Absolutely, right? There's no point creating a profusion of cards, one for MasterCard, one for PayPal, because the majority of the work is already done. That's the major effort. Maybe you'll just combine the, all the others, right? You just don't want to have a profusion of cards all over the place with little, little micro stories, right? If it doesn't make sense, don't do it. Right? Combine things, right? All right, let me just take one, uh, one quick pause here. Um, still relevant? Yes. Yeah, applicable, right? Yeah. So, so here's another interesting one, uh, zero, one, and many. So here, we're often dealing with collections of things. 
searching for things, deleting collections of things, managing collections of things. So as an online shopper, I want to delete items from my shopping cart. The zero one many principle essentially says uh, doing nothing is the simplest thing you can do, right? Do you really need to do it at all, right? That's the zero case. Um, and perhaps handling uh, the zero case is relevant and the easiest thing to do. Doing one thing is, is easier doing than many things, so you tackle that. Maybe I'll only allow you to delete one thing at a time. Yeah, it's a little painful for you as a user, but this is a short-term thing, right? So, um, oops. And then, so deleting one thing, and then finally, you know, broadening it to, uh, to many things. So, so th this is another very uh, common pattern to apply, right? There's, as I mentioned, there's a host of other patterns. I've just selected some nine representative ones. There's one important one that I want to sort of spend some time on talking about next, which is about business rules, right? And I'm going to tie that with the notion of uh, acceptance criteria as well, right? So any questions on, 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 the, uh, on the patterns um, we've studied so far? No? Okay. So business rules provide um, a strong way for us uh, to sort of make things smaller um, you know, from a splitting perspective. And you guys mentioned that every story should conform to the three C's, confirmation being uh, an integral part of, of, of a story. So, so to tease out the business rules is obviously what you're doing when you talk about acceptance criteria, I imagine, right? So if I had to sort of play along with you here, right? So I'm going to say, I, I'm a product owner. You're my team. Uh, uh, you, the, the programmers, the testers, the business me's, whatever. And as a user, I want to essentially create, uh, let my learner log into my organization and create a password that's uh, not easy to crack. Okay, that's the story. Now, what are the business rules there? I want to let my learners create an account and provide a password that's not easy to crack. What are the business rules? You're my team. So, so minimum six and maximum 12. Okay, that's one business rule. What else? Should be changed every three months, special characters. Lot equal to the last five parts. Should not be a dictionary word. So you guys are pros at this, right? What are all of these? These are business rules, right? Uh, <clears throat> now, what do I mean by example? So let's take the minimum character and maximum character thing, right? Exactly. If you're the tester types, right, they're always thinking the boundary cases, right? How can I break this thing, right? I mentioning the rule is one thing. Examples essentially exemplify uh, the happy paths and the crappy paths for all of these different rules, right? And oftentimes, that's what test cases are made of, right? Are these various ex um, um, scenarios that exemplify um, either the rule being met or being broken, right? That's essentially an example. So Matt Wynn, the guy who gave us Cucumber, uh, introduces this idea of example mapping, um, and there's a nice uh, blog post on example mapping. It's a technique that I use heavily in the organization that I am on, uh, in, in order to engage less technical people in the conversation on uh, defining the boundaries of a story. Give me the rules. I'm not going to say acceptance test. I'm not going to say give and then, gherkin, blah, blah, blah. None of that. Just give me the rules surrounding a story and then, then engage the testers and the business piece. Give me examples because this is powerful as a programmer for me to guide my development. Okay? So we're doing this before development begins on any story. Right? Lots of little things happen by, by thinking about this uh, of... of uh, these acceptance criteria in this manner. And also, it provides a natural seam to break the story up. Maybe the, the last, not repeating the last five passwords or change it every three months is not important enough. But let the product owner make that choice. As a team, we're giving them real options by doing this, right? Um, so that could be a natural seam to break stories into small things, right? And then also, these rules are nothing but your acceptance criteria. And if you get your testers engaged in this process early enough, perhaps they can give us these examples, illustrative examples, and these become nothing but your acceptance scenarios. Now, whether you express them as give and then and, and make them automated tests, you can see the choices are limitless, but it, this gives us a way to move towards uh, the right kind of behavior in terms of 
how we want to get these stories to done while also providing a, a mechanism to split stories. Okay. All right. Um, any questions about this? Right. How many of you are using example mapping or some similar technique for gleaning acceptance criteria? Yeah, a few guys. Oh, there's a few. And do you guys concur with me? Lightweight, powerful way to do this, right? Yeah. So, all right. <clears throat> when all else fails, we have our spikes, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> you went through all these techniques. You said, I still don't know how to uh, break the story up. Perhaps the domain is such that there is just not enough information or knowledge intrinsic within the team that you can uh, break this down. You spike is a way to not necessarily split, but essentially you're giving yourself a, a time boxed amount of time to investigate whatever it is question that you're trying to answer so that, they, that, so that that information can help you break things up into bite-sized chunks. Right? So I'm assuming all of us have used spikes. Before, right? so. All right. So for those who haven't seen this, I would mention there's none of these techniques are new, right? And there's lots of techniques, but I really like this particular one by Richard Lawrence. Um, it's their uh, uh, story splitting strategies. I love that in a one pager, he's depicted all the different strategies that we've discussed and more. Um, but again, even this is not the complete list, right? Uh, look up Kent McDonald, uh, look up, uh, I don't know. The, Look at, the, look at the reference list that I have in the back of the slides. Lots of, lots of different strategies, but this is, this is a nice little cheat sheet. Richard Lawrence. Richard Lawrence. And you can just look up uh, a story splitting cheat sheet and you'll find it. So we print this off in our team rooms. It's just a little uh, useful, useful for it to be there. Right? <clears throat> so any questions thus far? No, uh, not, not in this session, but I can happy to have uh, a conversation later, okay? All right. I have five minutes. I want to sort of close this out with, uh, uh, with, with a few other thoughts. Um, so over the session, we've talked a little bit about the story splitting strategies and so forth. Um, I just recently uh, discovered um, this, this idea that Goiko um, mentions. It's, it's about thinking about uh, stories, whether they're good stories or whether these are really bogus stories, looking at it through the lens of what he calls the zone of control and sphere of influence. These are systems thinking, uh, thinking concepts that we that he's very elegantly applied to stories. Okay, so let me before we talk about good stories, bad stories, let me just quickly explain to the best of my understanding what this means. So, zone of control is things, uh, activities that's fully within our control. Right. So things like. Uh, coding and testing, things that we can do, right, fully in control of. Sphere of influence are things that we're not directly in control of, but we can impact them in some way, okay? So given these, two, and then there's also the third, third uh, aspect, which is external influences that we cannot control at all. It's really, we can neither, it's not in our control, and neither can we really influence it, right? This is just third party external dependencies that we can't deal with. So given these um, systems thinking tools about the zone of control and sphere of influence, what Goyko suggests is take a look at your stories. The deliverables, the I want part of a user story, the I want part of a user story. Uh, <clears throat> and then he looks at the user need, which is so that the larger outcome, going back to that user story format. <clears throat> he essentially, what he's, what, what he's suggesting is good stories are things from a deliverable perspective that we as a team can actually control, um, <clears throat> but the, the outcome is not really our control, but it's within the, uh, uh, it's really, we, we can influence it. That's what we are doing. We are building these things in order to influence the right outcome. So what Goyko says, suggests is good stories generally, if you look at it through this lens, should fall there, right? Within our control, when I say our, the team's control in terms of the what, uh, the functions that we're cre creating, um, and they can impact but not fully control the, uh, the outcome. Bad stories, and this is where I think a light bulb went off, went off for me, because oftentimes I see teams creating stories 
for the sake of creating stories, because we have to fit these things, and you know, my Scrum Master is shouting at me if I don't have at least four stories to sprint, 10 stories to sprint, whatever the case may be. Now, misleading stories will usually be in this quadrant, where the team is in full control of the function, the, function, the I want part, also in full, full control of the, um, um, the, the outcome, right? As a database person, I want to create a database uh, table so that I can do a join. Okay, <laughs> so I'm, that is right here, right? <laughs> so be wary of those sorts of stories, micro stories, misleading stories, fake stories, there's lots of different terms. And I, when I saw these examples, I said, man, that, that makes a lot of sense, right? So good stories usually are reside in the squadron. It's also a good tool uh, for us to think about those stories that we there's nothing we can do about certain things. If I cannot uh, control a certain de deliver because I have a dependence on somebody else, there's little you can do about it, right? It's outside your, uh, your zone of control. Then you really have unrealistic expectations um, and things that are just not actionable, right? What do you do about those sorts of things, right? Oftentimes we have dependencies with uh, security teams or infrastructure teams, whatever the case may be. The idea then is if you're starting to see stories in those quadrants, we do the best we can to bring them here by splitting and so forth. And, and if there are still some outliers that, that, that are, are here, then you're assuming a risk because you can't control the outcome. Make sense? So I thought it was a useful way to sort of think about uh, 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 stories. Questions or thoughts? I'll sort of wrap this up and leave some time for questions. That's an anti-pattern, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Well, so let me answer that question first, right? Um, so you have lots of lots of spikes in in, in your sprints. <laughs> okay, but typically, right? You have some. I think to me it's an anti-pattern because you're not doing enough upfront grooming, right? We looked at all these strategies as if that things are happening just in time. And in order to have good flow in, and a good rhythm, you have to do look ahead planning, right? So some of you may have heard about Three Amigos sessions and so forth, right? You heard of Three Amigos session? This like, Three Amigos grooming sessions? Where, where, so Three Amigos grooming sessions is the Three Amigos, our friends, are business, testing, and development. A subset of those three facets are looking at your prior, uh, backlog and doing this decomposition ahead, maybe a sprint ahead, maybe just, in, I don't know what the right duration is, but it's not all during your sprint planning. Because if you start to do this sort of decomposition just in sprint planning, good luck with that because it's gonna be a complete nightmare, right? So you are doing some deliberate upfront front, just in time, but a little ahead, right? To help mitigate some of those concerns. If you start to see 50% of your story spikes, that there's a deeper problem with how you're dealing with stories and, and, and your agile rhythm. Okay, yeah. Yeah, there's always going to be the idea of technical stories or architecture, or, uh, and then you have to build, build enough runway so as to actually build the stories. So the, the, that's a good question, and again, you have to balance uh, some of those architectural stories with your business value stories as first class citizens in your uh, sprint backlog. We do this all the time. But be wary, don't completely jam 10 sprints worth of just saying runway stories, right? I need to do this. But a uh, good question, you still have one prioritized backlog, you have enough trust, or maybe you have a technical PO in, in addition to a business PO, whatever the strategy is, but you're balancing those concerns with your business value stories, right? Okay. When is it going to be done? <laughs> when is it? Right, and that's a, a, it's a difficult question. And as a consultant, I'd say it depends. Right? <laughs> so, uh, but let's talk offline a little bit about that because there's multiple answers to that question. Right? No straightforward way to 
say I have to meet a certain date, uh, how do I, there's uncertainties. It's, uh, yeah, essentially, spikes are trying to mitigate uncertainties. To me, even some of these stories are about mitigating uncertainties, uncertainties in, in, in the real value proposition. That's why you're trying to make them small, right? So, um, <clears throat> uh, let me summarize and then maybe we'll have just another minute. I, I'm getting the, uh, the evil eye there to wrap this up. So, <laughs> uh, so what you export is definitely, if you're not looking at invest, definitely look at it. Look at all your stories through the invest model. Um, you, you don't be sort of uh, stuck to that format. It doesn't matter whether you use the Connextra format or not, as long as your role, what, and uh, why are being answered. Uh, and also, small stories are not about fitting into a sprint. It's really about making sure you're discovering what really matters, right? That's how you present story splitting, and uh, uh, that's how you, you present it to your business as why you need them engaged in this process. It's not something that you do in isolation. It's not just the team's job, and it's not just the PO's job either. It's a collaborative effort. Um, and again, to somebody mentioned, it's about fitting things into a sprint. If you are adhering to these uh, ideas, they will naturally fit into a sprint. I wouldn't go about saying, I want to make them small because I want to fit them into a sprint. That should not be the... Uh, really the reason. Uh, pat, explore the patterns and be very, very dogmatic about uh, actionable acceptance criteria and scenarios um, and try this example mapping and see if that helps. Try that zone of control thing and look at your, go back and try your stories and say where do they really fall? It may, it may reveal a, uh, uh, at least at least you'll be informed. Uh, are, these, are these really valuable stories? Are they not? Right? So. Um, so that's that. Uh, maybe I have time for one or two questions, maybe, or, yeah? He's going to allow it. <laughs> so Actually, uh, uh, we've run out of time, okay. and we need to clear the partitions for the next session. Yeah, yeah I'm going to uh, provide this uh, deck. Uh, I'm going to upload it. I tried mo this morning. Uh, thank you for your participation, and I'm happy to hang around here and answer some questions. So. Thanks. Thanks thank for being you. here.